today, I would like to concentrate on a fascinating article that you published last month on GnosticMedia.com, uh, Manufacturing the Deadhead, a Product of Social Engineering, which gets into a fascinating field of research tying in Gordon Wasson and the CIA and MKUltra and the creation of the 60s drug counterculture into a fascinating thesis. And uh, it's difficult to summarize this, but one sentence that is particularly intriguing is that uh, it says here, for example, the counterculture had been developed by elements within the U.S. government and banking establishment as part of a larger plan to bring about a new dark age, or as it was marketed to potential victims, an archaic revival. And this gets into all sorts of fascinating fields of uh, nooks and crannies of research. And you begin the article by talking about your um, research from last year, showing that Gordon Wasson had been uh, linked even in primary documents with the CIA. But I'm not sure if you want to start there, or perhaps we could start even further back talking about the actual origin of LSD, which is not what most people think it is. Why don't we first discuss our last article for those who aren't familiar with it uh well just just to begin the um the real centerpiece of the uh, manufacturing the deadhead was um not so much the discovery of um the letter that described uh, project 58's um uh, sub project 58 mk ultra sub project 58's um funding but the understanding of who was the individual asking for the funds. And um, you were able to determine that it was Gordon Wasson, that there was absolutely no chance that it could be anyone else. And so that really, I think, is a, a good point to start that discussion. Is yeah, that, It's called a list of institutional notifications, which is a list of, that's where I got... J.P. Morgan National Philosophical Society. It's only about You're talking a, about with regard to subproject 58, the, uh, yeah. the document that relates it to J.P. Morgan specifically. Yeah. And now, the <clears throat> thing I'm not really quite sure on is, I'm not sure if I independently got Wassum's name. I mean, it's obvious it's him. Or I just got that from the search firm of the Manchurian Candidate. Now, with those files there that are in Wa obviously Wasson's own writing, and they've got his New York 823 Wall Street whited out there and his signature whited out, but it's pretty pretty clear because that it's him because only he was involved in three prior expeditions. So there's no other right. person that could have that could have been, you know, Good. putting that together. Right. And so, so it's clear that it's was. And is there any chance that those notes came from another fund that the CIA inserted in there? Or are those official part of MK Ultra Sub Project Fifty Eight? No, they're definitely Sub Project Fifty Eight documents. Okay. And he would gain an ally. Costaneda would gain an ally through ingesting Datura and uh, the psilocybin mushrooms. So uh, that was how we hooked people because people were already. The, the audience had been prepared for at least 15 years, going back to Aldous Huxley, you know, and the, the uh, mescaline uh, ingestion that Huxley had gotten involved with back in, I think, 1953. Surprise, then, surprise. Then there was Wasson in 1957 with the publication about the Mazatec mushrooms. When you go through the documents on Gordon Wasson, you see that he's working, you know, and I've, I, I went to... Uh, Princeton through the Mud Library and pulled a, a lot of documents from the CFR archives there that show that Wasson was actually a chairman for the Council on Foreign Relations and he's working with guys like Walter Mitt Lippmann. I pulled a document out of the U.S. <laughs> Library of Congress that shows that Wasson was working with Edward Bernays, the father of propaganda, for at least a decade. And uh, when you see all of the things tie in together and, and the social engineering that Bernays was doing and what Wasson was doing, I think that they tie perfectly in together. And then, um, you know, at the uh, Hoover Institute up at Stanford, I found a, a, a letter from Wasson to Bertram Wolf where he says essentially that the, uh, you know, he's, he's asking Bertram Wolf if, if he remembers the last letter to him. And he says, where I was asking you where Tolstoy had said that the printing press was a mighty, a mighty engine for disseminating ignorance. And then he turns and says, and this Mazatec affair is a case in point, you know, and this is just a week after he, after he's published this big sob story in the New York Times 
where he's supposedly expressing all of this remorse in the newspaper about what he's done, even though he casts half the blame on Maria Sabina, who he set up by going through the uh, uh, mayor's office in the first place. And, you know, when he went to Maria Sabina's home, they thought it was official business. And that's the only reason why she talked to him at all, at all because uh, uh, the mayor showed up at her door and asked her to talk to Wasson. And so, uh, you know, of course, Wasson casts half this blame on her, but you know, here was, and he creates the psychopaths and hippies, etc., that he complains about that descended on Hualta de Jimenez. But he turns around and complains about them when he's the very guy who created them by launching this entire psychedelic movement with the help of guys like uh, Aldous Huxley. And interestingly, right. you know, Gordon Wasson, you know, I have numerous letters where Gordon Wasson you know, between Wasson and, for instance, DCI Dulles or Wasson and numerous other guys where he's attempting to recruit them or or they are being recruited or brought in as members to the uh, Century Club. The Century Club is, you know, it's a basically it's an art association <coughs> on the East Coast. It's it's actually, and I looked up, uh, looked, did a lot of research into it. It's basically a CIA front. Um, last week I was watching this movie on the Lincoln assassination and interestingly right in the middle of the plot is the Century club but uh so dci alan dulles and gordon wasson appear to have been two head key figures there and they bring in guys like ellsworth bunker the ambassador to vietnam and uh you know all of these other figures like uh, george keenan frank ashtol who's the it was a member of the cfr and a big banker his son arthur ashtol was one of the guys who uh worked with goldman sachs up until 2002 you know, so there's all of these banking tie-ins there between, you know, between Wasson and the, these other guys and the CFR and everything. Then there was Wasson in 1957 with the publication about the Mazatec mushrooms, and then of course peyote and the Native American church people already knew about that. So all of these, all of these, and Jimson weed was well known at least in California. There, there were American Indians in California still using it. So anyway, what what uh, Costaneda did was take this kind of interest in psychedelics and then take it out of its context in, in the United States and transpose it over to Mexico, which is exactly what Waffen had already done back in, in 1957. You know, what's interesting is these people all seem to be very adept at public relations, you know, and uh, Wasson obviously was trained by his uh, close friend Edward Bernays, who is the father of propaganda. You, you have in the 60s, you have this combination of, um, of, of dance, um, music, mm -hmm. uh, and, and theater, movies, yeah. right? Yeah. And it's, you know, you have Easy Rider, you have all of the promotion of the drug mm -hmm. culture mm -hmm. that comes out in, in, in all of these uh, movies, a lot of them associated with people in, in, living in Laurel Canyon. You've got all this rock and roll music that suddenly pops up out of nowhere. Right. And, um, and then, of course, you have this collection of dancers uh, called the Freaks, led by this guy Vito, who um, they always appear at all of these events and kind of help, you know, get the crowd into the mood of drug taking. It's all, you know, it's like if you look at what happened when these, when these bands, the Birds and the Doors sort of mm -hmm, appearing, mm -hmm. you had the, the dance, this electronic sound, um, and you had the drug, right? Well, that's really interesting if you look at someone like Edward Bernays, mm. okay, because Bernays, before he began his propaganda career in, in the War is Good department, where Wilson sent him during when World War I came about, where he worked with um, people who had specialized in, in social control. Before that, um, he had three separate projects. One was a play called Damaged Goods, which was the most highly sexualized play that had ever been presented in, in America. Wow. New York Times wrote a review of it calling, it is now sex o'clock in America. I was interested in all kinds of social affairs, not societal affairs, but social affairs, that had to do with a better society. And so I wrote Bennett and said, the editors of the Medical Review of Review will be glad to support you in your effort to produce this play.
because at that time there was a man in New York, Anthony Comstock, who fought anything having to do with anything that might be considered to be slightly off color. And venereal disease was more than off color. It couldn't be mentioned in any society, very, polite or otherwise. Very bold undertaking for that period, really. So I wrote to this actor, who was the father of Joan Bennett, whom you've seen on the screen, and next and signed it the editors. I'd learned that from the Atlantic Monthly, which always signed its letters, the editors. And next morning, there was a telephone call from Richard Bennett. Will you come up to the Lambs Club and have lunch with me? I want to talk to the editors. And I said, I'm the editors. So I came up and had lunch with him. And after that lunch, we decided, or I decided, and my associate, who was 22 years old, agreed that we would organize the Medical Review of Reviews Sociological Fund. We would charge $4 for admission to the fund, and that, the $4, would give you the opportunity to see damaged goods performed by Richard Bennett and a company. And in order to build up this to have status in New York at the time, we got John D. Rockefeller Jr., who was interested in fighting venereal disease, and Abram Flexner and others to become members of the Medical Review of Reviews sociological fund and before we knew it this performance went on and incidentally I found out later by looking at the list of those who were present that Franklin Delano Roosevelt and his wife Eleanor were present were both this. in the audience were both in the audience and this play which was performed in New York at the Gaiety Theater made such a terrific sensation that next day the newspapers were full of it and one man sagely observed it has struck sex o'clock in America. <laughs> <laughs> at this point... What year was this? 1913. Right. So, very highly sexualized play. He brought out Enrico Caruso. He, he was actually Enrico Caruso's promoter and producer for his tour. And you have to remember, at this time, Caruso was very risque. You know, the, the, so that, was the, that was where the culture was. And then, moreover, his next event was he promoted the Russian dancer Nijinsky, who was like Polish extraction, but came from Russia. And he was famous for his risque outfits. And, and in, his, in an interview, um, Bernays said that he completely changed the attitude of toward dance in America. Now, this is amazing because this all occurs before he's 22 years old. He's promoted these three events, all of them which if you look forward... Yeah, and he was even offered a job as an editor for a medical journal or something. Well, he was like that, that before, before right. that. And then from his, his role as, a, as an editor, he started doing all these theatrical promotions. I mean, these was, it was just amazing that he had this trajectory and then went straight into the war is good department, uh, creating propaganda for the country. But it, I'm just saying it's interesting if you look at the trajectory. What's interesting is these people all seem to be very adept at public relations, you know, and uh, Wasson obviously was trained by his uh, close friend Edward Bernays, who is the father of propaganda. Terrence McKenna admitted in an audio recording that he was a PR guy. Well, I, often when asked this question, I've said, you know, it beats honest work. I mean, my brother is a PhD in three subjects and uh, works in hard science, and uh, it, I don't think it's brought him immense happiness, not that he's despondent, but uh, I was always kind of a slider. Uh, <laughs> You know, and uh, certainly when I reached La Chirera in 1971, 
I had a price on my head by the FBI. I was running out of money. I was at the end of my rope. And then uh, they recruited me <laughs> and said, you know, with a mouth like yours, there's a place for you in our organization. And, um, you know, I've worked in deep background positions about which the, best, the less said the better. And then, you know, about 15 years ago, they shifted me into public relations, and I've been there uh, to the present. You know, and of course, people don't get that a, a PR guy is a paid liar. And they'll say, well, you know, Terrence McKenna liked to tell stories, and he was recruited by the mushroom. But get this, folks, somebody who is in propaganda, who is in public relations, is a paid liar there to fool you. A bard, if you look it up even on Wikipedia, it says someone who is hired by the king to tell the king's story. Right. You know, Terrence right. McKenna went around all the time saying, I'm a bard. Exactly. So he was, he was advising uh, the colonizers, like the British and the Dutch, to to use the same strategy that the, the Russians had used in Siberia to create a native revival and to reward them for whatever kind of uh, trait that they had that they could exhibit and get, uh, get the uh, attention of the colonizer. And I think this is exactly what they did then later with the Mazatec and the Huichol and the Mayan. Uh, all of these... Uh, waves, let's call them, waves of diverting American counterculture into Mexican Indians was, were, were predicated on the advice that Bateson gave back in 1944 of having a native revival, but I guess it got renamed later as the Archaic Revival. Is that, is that what you understand? Yeah, that's exactly right. And it appears that Terrence McKenna was familiar with all of this. And again, like I said, you know, Gregory Bateson working with MK Ultra working with Aldous Huxley, Watson, etc. Uh, we know for sure with Huxley, uh, I don't know if he and Watts, Watson directly communicated. If they did, that would be huge. But then uh, Terrence McKenna takes this and remarkets it again as the Archaic Revival, which we uh, discussed in our article, Manufacturing the Deadhead. So uh, it, the, the theme here is neo-feudalism. And what we've also found is that, aside from just this native revivalism, they do want to bring about a new dark age. In fact, Terence McKenna called himself a a uh, a new dark age, or that he wanted to bring about a new dark age. And so, you know, we have that quoted in that article. But um, so, neo feudalism was essentially the agenda: get us all back into a neo feudalist society. And then, as I discussed with General Stubblebein, uh, in that interview, uh, and he admitted that Aldous Huxley, as far as he could tell, was in charge of MK Ultra. I had discovered that it looked very obvious that uh, Aldous Huxley was uh, one of the key people, if not the head of MK Ultra, directing the studies, etc., to be done. Sure. Uh, you agree with that statement yeah. as the former head of Army Intel? And um, uh, can you give any information on uh, what Aldous Huxley's position was? Mm, uh, I don't think I should. But um, that whole thing, all, you know, the, the intel, all of that ties in together, and it kind of makes this nice little bow that they were using against us, uh, trying to drive us essentially using Huxley's Brave New World uh, to recollide us into ancient Hindu society with the ancient Hindu caste system, uh, the alphas, betas, deltas, epsilons in Huxley's book would become, you know, the, or the Hindu caste society became Huxley's, you know, uh, alpha, beta, delta, epsilon, etc. So this was the agenda, and this stuff goes all the way back to the Mahabharata. I think that one of the things that Huxley was, uh, it's difficult not to say Huckster, but it's one of the things that Huxley was pushing was indeed the Western analog of the Hindu caste system. Another thing that he was pushing was mindless subservience for most of the, um, the population. 
Another thing that he was pushing was um, uh, absolute and total social control of all biological and uh, physiological functions so that everything exists only with the permission and at the behest of the state. Mao was pushing that too. Hitler was pushing that too. Um, uh, Obama is now pushing that. Bush was pushing that. This Stalin, is transnational yeah. Stalin. I don't, I'm sure Genghis Khan was doing it within the context of his own technological um, measure. You know, uh, I was just looking up uh, Gregory Bateson in the brain database here, and uh, he admits one of his largest influences is Aldous Huxley. We've got him under uh, Harold Abramson. He's at the Macy conferences. Yeah. Um, Abramson gave him LSD for the first time. Yes, yeah, so, yes, exactly. <laughs> and uh, guess who he gave LSD to for the first time? Now, that I don't remember. That would be Ken Kesey. Now, uh, we have uh, in the in the in the online video uh, a conversation about LSD where Tim Leary admits that they're all agents. He says our agency is talking about them driving around in a bus. I, I think you know it's an interesting thing too. As you go around the country, I'm sure you all have this experience. You talk to uh, middle-aged, fairly respectable people in Tucson, Arizona, and they said, this is where the acid thing really happened. <laughs> Tucson. In San Francisco, this is where it really happened. The Lower East Side, you know, they said that's where it really happened. And uh, yeah. the, uh, no one has ever really um, um, told us what was going on in Los Angeles during those uh, years. I think much more was done down here. There was a much wider range. There were more doctors involved. There were more scientists involved. We had Gerald and Aldous. Yes, right, right, right. yeah. And uh, Ivan, uh, was, uh, then, uh, of course, it was part of the coolness of the Los Angeles cell, whatever you want to call it, that they kept a, uh, you kept a... Uh, well, you might not call it a cell, let's call it a cluster. <laughs> <laughs> Our undercover agents in Los Angeles were very cool about, uh, uh, and yet they did more in a very uh, laid-back way. Uh, and it's never been as public, public as uh, some of the other, uh, yeah. you, you know, the buses running around the country. Yeah, and then Zinberg and says that. that the visionary experience and all the things he was doing at Harvard and the others, his residents and the rest that he was giving LSD to, they never had a visionary or an ecstatic or a mystic experience, but the whole thing was a California invention. He said, and he said, and the only well, time it ever happened right. was when you crossed the Colorado River. <laughs> Uh, he meant, you know, obviously the bus being Ken Kesey. So we know Kesey's an agent. We know Leary's an agent. Here's Bateson dosing Kesey. Hey, one of the, uh, one of the beer guys, you can correct me here if I'm wrong, but uh, one of the guys in the Grateful Dead is currently a member of the uh, Bohemian Grove. Is that is that true? I, I think it's uh, three of them. Bob Weir. Mickey Hart and one other possibly. So yes, oh, really? uh, yeah, and, and 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 Bob Weir. I I've found videos of Bob Weir actually uh, bragging about it. Um, <laughs> what insights can you share with us about your performance at the Bohemian Grove? <laughs> well, <laughs> tell you what, I don't talk much about the Bohemian Grove because you know it's. It's a place that people go to get away from from the spotlight. You know, a lot of a lot of relatively uh, well-known guys are members of that club. But uh, basically, it was founded uh, 130 years ago or so uh, by artists and writers for artists and writers. And still, in order to get in, you have to have something to offer in that in that kind of in that regard a lot of the a lot of the members are uh, you know successful entrepreneurs or businessmen of one sort or another but they they all have an artistic bent um, the stuff you hear about it in the rumor mill is while entertaining I've never caught any original sacrifices <laughs> um, anything kind of remotely like that <laughs> I've had some interesting times up there um, and you know there are a lot of movers and shakers in that club, and I enjoy the uh, I enjoy the chance 
given my, my, my mindset, my Weltschmerz, if you will, uh, I enjoy a chance to, to, get, to get together with the, those guys and knock a couple back and, uh, and talk it down. I, one time I uh, spent a weekend up there, um, I ran into a guy named uh, General Bill Quinn. And we had a couple drinks together. We were sitting in front of a fireplace. And we just started telling, we, we, we fell, fell in together. And we started telling, you know, war stories. He was the guy that uh, Hermann Goering uh, sur surrendered, not his sword, but his, basically it was a mace. He surrendered his, but he, uh, he, sought, uh, he sought out Bill Quinn, uh, Wild Bill Quinn, who was also the, uh, the original, um, the original head of the OSS, which became the CIA, who was a very, very interesting guy. And we just went back and forth. We had a crowd of people um, gathered around us at all times. And we'd, we'd about late afternoon, we'd, uh, we'd wander onto the deck where the fireplace was, sit down, get, grab a couple of drinks, and just start going back and forth. That kind of stuff. You know, these kinds of meetings and stuff like that are only going to happen there. Or, you know, that's, it's the only place where you can almost be assured of, where I can almost be assured of that, of meeting folks like this. Uh, so it's a, it's a great opportunity for me. It's also a great club. There's a, there's a, there's a sort of a, a an unwritten but a, a uh, hard and fast rule for uh, membership: uh, no jerks. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and they have an, uh, an entrance committee that, uh, that that they can sniff them out. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bob, those are those are great. You know, he's pretty. He thinks it's all pretty cool. You know, they all you know run with. Uh, the CIA groups, but of course, Bohemian Grove from the Bohemian Club in San Francisco, that is actually the sister club of the Century Club in New York, the, the famous art club, quote unquote. And then that was run by Alan Dulles, and uh, Alan Dulles and uh, Aldous Huxley and Gordon Wasson were also there. And of course, Gordon Wasson is the so called discoverer of magic mushrooms. And uh, which he stole from somebody else's research, uh, John G. Bork from 1891. But all of these guys centered around either uh, the Century Club or the Bohemian Club, etc. So we found a lot of this overlap, and we do know for sure that uh, the Bohemian Club grew directly out of the Century Club. Our speaker this evening has, to a very distinguished degree, what I like to think all centurions have in some degree, and that is a very considerable curiosity about matters which, strictly speaking, are none of their business, <laughs> or at least none of their main business. We number among our members one, for example, who, though his career has been devoted to the textual business, has written an authoritative book on American ferns, Mr. Cobb. But surely our member this evening has roamed farthest to field and he is a banker, a Morgan partner who has traveled to the remotest corners of this continent and of Asia in search of mushrooms, and not just ordinary mushrooms, if there is any such thing as an ordinary mushroom, but hallucinogenic mushrooms. For 10 years, he took trips to the rainy season to the remote mountains of the interior of Mexico. And only he knows how many trips on mushrooms he took when he got there. <laughs> He and the late Aldous Huxley, who many of you will remember as a member of this association, discussed at length the hallucinatory mushrooms, and both Huxley and our speaker have written about them. Like Huxley, Gordon Wasson was once a journalist, but he has recently done something neither Huxley nor any other journalist I have ever heard of has done. He has written a book which was so much in demand that it was out of print before it was published. Furthermore, it cost $200. <laughs> it was called Soma, the Divine Mushroom. Gentlemen, Mr. Gordon Wasson.
Thank you, Mr. President. Would you like us to remove this so that the screen no, no. is not in the way of the screen? Or not? No, no, no. Right. I'd say quite Let me right. sit down here, though. Let me see whether in the next few minutes, 25 minutes, I think I'm allocated, I can convey to you some impression of the, ex uh, the thrill, the intense excitement in which I've been living for some years. Well, I, I, just, I did an interview with this other guy, um, I don't know, quite a while back, and uh, he kept, met, he was apparently a big deadhead, big uh, deadhead from back in the day, a very big Grateful Dead fan, and he kept referencing them in the interview, and at one point said something to the effect of, well, I'm, I'm just glad that my band, you know, wasn't part of that whole Laurel Canyon scene and, and don't have that team. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was, uh, you know, I, I, I hate to break your heart, Brad, but I'm pretty sure that Bob Weir is a member of the boat. And he was just, like, stunned, just, uh, like, just, I just seemed to, like, just completely burst his little bubble and uh, sure. almost felt bad for having told him that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> tracks are pesky things, you know, and, uh, yeah, I mean, the Grateful Dead, I mean, they're, uh, you know, the association with Owsley, and, you know, I mean, they're, 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 there's a lot of uh, weirdness surrounding them. Sure. I mean, at one point they went, at one point they moved down to Watts, you know, uh, with Owsley, and, uh, and basically, we're running uh, LSD trials out of some decrepit home in Watts that was right alongside a bordello, you know, which, like, exactly parallels what the CIA itself was doing at the time in San Francisco and elsewhere, was sort of using, you know, you know these bordellos to run acid tests and stuff. And, and, you know, here we have the Grateful Dead going down to Watts, of all places, Doing the exact same thing, not not long, just months before uh, Watts went up in flames, you know. So, uh, yeah, the Grateful Dead, uh, they they have some very uh, very tantalizing connections to say the least. But uh, yeah, he was under the impression that they were sort of, you know, above all. That. <laughs> but, uh, did you did you read our uh, manufacturing the deadhead article that uh, exposed uh, their connections and how that was all manufactured uh, the whole look dance everything well you know and you heard I know you did hear my interview with uh, Supalakis uh, recently Yeah Wasn't I did yeah I, I that was god that was uh that was bizarre, you know. I thought I might actually be able to pick up a, a few little last-minute facts to, to tack onto my book, but uh, nothing she said had any credibility whatsoever. I mean, just uh, it was just mind-boggling. Do you think the, that the she that, was? Do you think that she was clueless, or do you think she's more of like a matriarch? Uh, I, you know, I, I don't know. It was hard to tell, you know. I mean, without meeting her face to face, uh, it, it was hard to get a gauge on, on what her agenda was. You know, I, I have, I'm, I'm surprised she even went on the air, kind of, you know. But uh, So that's where we get the uh, idea from right, that right. Uh, Vito, whether or not he was aware of it, seems to have been a key person behind it. And then when you tell me that all of these agents and FBI and all of these informants are coming around it, you know, either, either he had to have been an agent or, uh, he, uh, was being used by them for his talents. Does that make sense? Uh, well, they, they were intimidated by him, uh, because they, had some fear of his power and they wanted to be on top of the whole thing like what's he talking about now where is he going what are his ideas well, why uh, do you think doing? they were worried about him well he would get on to the networks like the joe pine show he was on the radio and the tv shows for joe pine about four times each on each of those networks and uh he spoke fluent Lithuanian to the head of KTLA, and uh, there was kind of a friendship there. But the 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 guy was later told by um, agents from Mayor Yorty's office that uh, Vito would never be on 
uh, KTLA again because of what he said on the Joe Pond show, which was innocent little things like uh, girls that get pregnant when they're young and instead of their parents jumping for joy that she, you know, achieved uh, the state of reproduction, uh, they were upset about it and wanting to end the pregnancy. So they, the powers didn't like stuff like that. They didn't like him talking about, uh, you know, you address your feelings about going into the Vietnam War when you were called up for service. We cite you. The research of Dave McGowan has shown that the connections between military intelligence and the music idols that promoted drug use to America's youth were too numerous to have been accidental. Among the many examples, Frank Zappa was the son of a specialist in chemical warfare. Jim Morrison's father was Admiral Morrison, the same Admiral Morrison who oversaw the false flag Gulf of Tonkin incident that launched the Gulf, uh, that launched the Vietnam War, etc. But you know, we we can see that. <clears throat> The entire thing is intentional public relations to keep people distracted with these false idols that the intelligence community sets up to, you know, steer the people around. And now, you know, Miley Cyrus and this nonsense being the latest creation of the mind control. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, they, 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 they do very much appear to, to be manufactured. And it wasn't as obvious in the 60s as it is now. I mean, now nowadays these people just come out of a... You know, they just come down the pike, like, prepackaged with an image and a sound. And, you know, the, the Lady Gagas and the Miley Cyruses and the, you know, whoever else is out there, Beyonce and, and whatnot. But even, but even then, I mean, you look at someone like Jim Morrison and you look at a, you know, there's a picture in the book, uh, in my book of him from just a year before he emerged on the scene where he's pictured on the, the deck of his father's sure. ship and... You would never think that this guy in just a year would, would emerge as this uh, iconic rock god. I mean, what you see is this very clean-cut, collegiate, conservative-looking kid, you know, and then just a year later, there he is on the strip with the flowing walks and the leather fringe jackets and whatever, and, and this whole sort of image and sound create, I mean, he just, it just, it just been just sort of become this larger than life character, literally like overnight. And, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's astounding, uh, you know, to, 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 to see that the transformation that he went through and you know, you know what, 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 what was, was that something that, that he, uh, himself felt the inspiration to do, you know, I mean, he just decided to adopt that look and, you know, it just, uh, it just, it just has a very manufactured quality to sure. it. And, and you, you look at the background of how these bands got together and, uh, you know, how quickly they were thrown together and, and provided with instruments and recording time and signed to contracts and all that, just like out of nowhere. I mean, these were like kids, these unknown kids that just flocked into Laurel Canyon from various parts of the country for no apparent reason. And next thing you know, they're just, they're, they're, they have all new instruments and they have recording contracts and they have studio time and they have club dates. And I mean, within, and within 60 years of their music being repeated nonstop on the radio as well. <laughs> I know, yeah, it's, it's to this day. So, yeah, it just had, it had a very, you know, the more you look at it, the more, the more the, the, it had a very, very manufactured quality to it, which, you know, wasn't perceived at the time. You know, all these people were, were elevated to, to the status of, like, gods, practically. Sure. And, uh, yeah, well, and just like I just quoted right now, that that was the intentional, that was the a yeah, actual intention and they is were, to and make they, them And gods. these were not, these, you know, these were not just, just singers, songwriters, and actors, you know, they were not just, just entertainers. These were people who were promoted to such prominence that they basically became the spokesmen and the de facto leaders of the, of the generation of the whole sort of resistance movement, you know, and, uh, and were, you know, uh, they were positioned to be in that, you know, in, in that sort of a position where they could have, enormous influence on on public opinion and uh, I mean, I, i'm pretty well convinced these days that no one that's in a position to have significant influence on public opinion is probably legitimate you know I
The film's storyteller is Daniel Pinchbeck. It follows him on his quest to find the new way forward so that a post-industrial world can flourish in harmony with nature. It argues that the future lies in both the application of new technology and an evolution in human consciousness. Quite controversially, it suggests that psychedelic drugs can play a role in bringing about this new mindset. It does seem like a throwback to the 1960s. The film grew out of a bestseller Pinchbeck wrote called 2012, The Return of Quetzalcoatl. We sort of took the ideas from that book but then extended it into more practical solutions like ecological design and ways to address the financial system. And then we talked about meditation and yoga. So I'm kind of like the narrator and the interviewer who kind of weaves, weaves the story together. The film features interviews with experts and celebrities. The film's message won't be to everyone's taste. Some critics will dismiss it as new age mumbo jumbo. Do you think that the people who are participating uh, in this documentary have very good practical ideas? I think uh, the way to solve the, the, the planet's problems at the moment is to think out of the box. And some of those ideas might seem a little crazy. But, uh, you know, revolutionary ideas always have. They've seemed a little strange. But we, we, need, we need to be in that mode at this particular time. Right. I just uh, I'm I'm very skeptical these days. I don't I don't think I don't think you get a soapbox unless you're part of the inner circle. Sure. I just don't think it I don't think it happens. You know, we, you and I can talk on some obscure, you know, internet podcast or whatever. But you know, <laughs> exactly. You don't but, you don't see me getting uh, offers from NBC for four million dollars for my podcast here. You know, <laughs> not anytime soon. No. Uh. Uh-uh. So I grew up with uh, <laughs> maybe you with parents who were hippies, and you know, and, and for both of them, that's the best time of their life. Like that was the highlight of their life. My dad was a an actor at the Berkeley Repertory Theater and the Magic Theater in Berkeley in the late '60s, early '70s, which is the '60s, right? And uh, he was in the psychedelic movement, did a lot of LSD, practiced free love, and it's like the he biggest, was on the campus. When the they got biggest attacked. part. He met Jim Morrison. He was uh, a yeah. Yeah, he went. He saw the Beatles play. I mean, he was all all about it, still about it, frankly. And, so, and I grew up. I grew up listening to all these records on vinyl. You know, all the classics, all these MK Ultra classics. Yeah, you notice like all that music has. You know, like you turn on the radio now, and it's the same as like when you were a kid. The same songs oh, it's over tough. and over and, it's really and tough. over and yeah. over and over. That's true. Yeah, you know, they're just trying to keep us in that '60s, early '70s phase. You know, keep the drug illusion going. But it's you know, a nice keep remi- classic rock right. and. And then you discover that all of these bands are out of Laurel Canyon, and they're right. all the Sons of Intelligence. And then, you know, uh, Jim Morrison's dad is the one who launched the uh, Vietnam War with the Gulf of Tonkin. Gulf of Tonkin, yeah. Admiral Morrison. <sighs> and, and then you got the song The End. The End, and uh, yeah, I mean, you all know, that the, apocalyptic stuff. All the yeah, it's just uh, it's just loaded with. In my opinion, uh, Gavin, what they want to do is get people to focus on their emotions yes. rather than a- any actual skill. Absolutely, which is why as well you would have had, very interestingly enough, with a lot of the late 60s stuff, the, the, excel- the, the, the accentuation of the Dionysian over the Apollonian. You know, the, 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 the more emotive over the reflective. Sure, and that's you know that's a, the same thing in uh, the rock and roll yeah, music yeah. and all of this stuff, and you and you you actually see it in the whole joke going back to music. You know, let's go back to what you just said: the Dionysian mysteries yeah. and uh, and rock idols, yeah, yeah. right? And then fast forward to mu- modern rock and roll music and the rock idols, and you get the joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, they're they're just playing on us. Oh, oh, hey, look, you know, this is how the ancients controlled the masses yeah. using these these techniques. So this is how we're going to yeah, do absolutely, it. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And, uh, you know, but, you know, now we have or they have the ability to use radio and television and the Internet yeah. to broadcast all of this mind control yeah. out, whereas, uh, you know, before it would kind of stay localized. That's true. That's true. And he, uh, it, this is the thing is what you see with the changing media. Because, I mean, when I was, because I was born in the 70s, and when I was growing up in, in Cork in the 80s, there wasn't, there, there was very, very little kind of, um, you, you had one kind of mainstream kind of like pop station which played pop music, which I didn't really listen to because I was more into kind of like, I was more into like 60s and 70s music. So there wasn't the sense of being bombarded as there is these days. 
I mean, you had to actually kind of like, the, like because the, I was really into it, like the, as I still am into a lot of the kind of like 60s and 70s music, but I had to kind of hunt it out because it wasn't being kind of imposed <laughs> upon me. Sure. But now you know that it's mind control, you know, so it adds this kind of extra layer of irony to it. It's like, well, you know, I can enjoy this and and tap along. But, you know, what was the real agenda behind putting this music out? What is the agenda of keeping society caught in 60s and 70s music for the last, you know, uh, 50 years? You turn on the radio station now, you hear the same music over and over and over. These two books aren't that far removed from one another, you know, despite what it means. You know, you think Laurel Canyon music scene, serial killers, not going to be much of a connection there, but there actually (laughs) is, you know. And, and, I mean, Charlie Manson's fingerprints are all over the Laurel Canyon scene, you know. I mean, he's throughout the book, but uh, what I didn't know until fairly recently is that there was another serial killer whose fingerprints were also... Not to the same extent, but, you know, quite a bit. Um, So, yeah, the whole peace and love scene was uh, a little more bloody and violent than than what we are supposed to believe. So, you know, going back to my interview with Dave McGowan and all of this, how did all of this make you feel? Did you get anything new out of that, or you were already on this track the whole uh, uh, time exposing all of this, or were you already aware that all of these serial killers were basically being created? Well, uh, with Dr. Wynn Michael Lordy, uh, I have the... Uh, proof that uh, at least four children that came under his care starting at age six became serial killers. Richmond, Virginia has a lot of serial killers, but most of them are uh, black. And um, as you know, black serial killers don't get the four. media attention. Four people under his... What, is, what? What? I wonder what are the chances? I mean, this is like... Uh, you know, the uh, woman doctor on Dexter in the last season or whatever, and her her own son is a serial killer, and she's helping Dexter, and Dexter's girlfriend is a serial killer. I mean, what are the chances of one psychiatrist knowing four serial killers? Are you sure they didn't base the show Dexter off of off of your family? <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I do know um, that the information that I've gathered... Uh the American people and people in general need to pay close attention. There's a game being played on all of us. And as humans, we need to become more aware. Once I became aware, my criminal mentality was completely erased. It's gone. And so therefore, uh, I think that uh, the more knowledge we as a people, we the people, the more knowledge we have, the more control we have over our faculties. And auto-hypnosis is, is, is a taught um, trait. And I know that the CIA specifically used auto-hypnosis to see if they could um, get people conditioned so that they, for instance, I think the example they used was to be kept in uh, filthy, um, terrible, uncomfortable, even, I guess, painful um, living circumstances and, and that they would the person would just go into their own mind and not be affected by it, which, of course, reminds me of six months tied to a bed in a straitjacket. So um, there's some similarities. Now, uh, you know, in our in my research on MK Ultra, I've come across uh, some interesting things. I want to read this to you. This is from uh, Aldous Huxley's uh, letters in a book called Moksha. And uh, this is... Uh, uh, to uh, Dr. Humphrey Osmond, September 23rd, 1956. Quote, our last experiment with, and notice he says our last experiment, and he's writing this to Dr. Humphrey Osmond. And he says, our last experiment with LSD in conjunction with hypnosis, the idea being to hypnotize participants and give them a post and give them post hypnotic suggestions to the effect that they would be able to reproduce the LSD experience at a given time 
or at a given word of command, was not very successful so far as the hypnotic procedure was concerned. It may be that the suggestions in order to be successful have to be repeated on several occasions, or it may be, of course, that the effects of the chemical are not reproducible by, uh, by psychological means. At any rate, in the majority of cases, what is interesting to me in the experiment was the fact that 50 gamma of LSD to produce in me uh, virtually the full effect of the standard dose. Okay, and we see throughout Moksha that he's actually uh, recommending these uh, LSD hypnosis studies. Now, when we go to Acid Dreams, page 7, uh, part of the quote there says, one of the CIA's professional consultants in H, quote-unquote, techniques, which I think is probably Huxley techniques, also questioned why, uh, or, or it could be just uh, hypnosis techniques in general, also questioned why hypnosis was attempted, quote, after a long and continuous use of chemicals, after the subject had vomited, and after, apparently, a maximum tolerance point had been reached with the chemicals. End quote. And then uh, continuing, everyone who read the interrogation report agreed that hypnosis was useless, if not impossible, under such conditions. So this is twofold. One, we see Huxley actually recommending these studies, and we see an overlap between acid dreams and uh, other MK Ultra research. And uh, so we know, you know, here, and there's other, many other examples in Huxley's Moke, so that he was actually involved in uh, guiding MK Ultra research. But two, here's this uh, other statement by Huxley with hypnosis and LSD, and uh, you know it. Uh, you know the doctors are complaining about it. Would you agree with this analysis, or from your experience, was it actually su- successful? Oh, uh-huh. I think they, I think they had hypnosis down to a fine art. I think they do exactly. I mean, there's a lot of, of declassified material and, and stuff written about um, what do they call it. Rapid hypnotic induction. Um, with it, it can be as simple as a a finger, uh, a cue with a finger, uh, a particular word, a particular phrase. Um, I think they know, and I think they probably, especially all these years later, I think you can. I think they could hypnotize someone with a snap of the fingers. You remind. It reminded me when you were reading that. You know, I was when I started was talking about the Kennedy assassination. I didn't actually complete what I was uh, what I was going to say is when when I had um Curlin on the phone uh during the lawsuit I talked to him and he he and I had an extremely disturbing conversation. I was trying to find out from him what happened um you know how come he knew I was in that seclusion room um um you know he took me out he agreed he took me out he agreed with all of it and then he began to say some strange things to me he 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 said to me um you don't remember the Kennedy assassination, do you? And I said, yeah, I remember that. He said, you don't remember the Kennedy assassination, do you? And I said, yes, I, I do. I just said that. He said it a third time. Three times in a row he said that. And I always found that to be very disturbing. That he, I think he was trying to do something there. I was never too sure what, but he was he was up to something. And when you read that, it reminded me of that. He was He was, I think, trying to gain control. And then he said something to me along the lines of, um, you need to get on a plane and, and, and uh, you need to sit across from me and look into my eyes and let me buy you a plane ticket. He lived in California at that time. I said, no, no, no. He said, let me buy you a bus ticket. And I said, no, absolutely not. And again, he, he, it's just that, just that exchange suggests the possibility of a hypnotic command. Which is why I think, you know, my memory ends with him right at the door. And, and, and I have, you know, three very, very brief memories of the man and nothing else. Gone. Nothing else. You know, and, and uh, my research on MK Ultra, I have exposed a number of... Uh former uh, agents in various areas and you know we're always uh, finding more i essentially once you figure out how the system works it's not too hard to you know to uh you know it, you know i get that uh, it, it appears that what they a lot of this is based on as far as intel and the mind is concerned 
it seems to be along the lines of Marshall McLuhan and a lot of these guys and using the classical trivium, using logical fallacies and appeals to emotion, switching the conversation off to another topic with the red herring, all of these sorts of tactics. Would you agree with that? Oh, uh, yeah, it's part of the game. That's part they, of the game. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, incidentally, they played that same game with with me and many uh, many occasions. Which so they play they, they they play the game against their own. You're saying? That's right. Yeah, they play the game. You know, against me. Well, why don't you define exactly what is the trivium and what is its importance? Well, in a very disintegrated form, uh, the three subjects which make up the trivium are part of what's called a classical education today, uh, which very few of us get, get in this country. To the word trivium itself, it's a uh, Latin for the intersection of three roads. So it's a metaphor for the three subjects of the trivium, which are specifically general grammar, formal or Aristotelian logic, and uh, classical rhetoric. Now, we've all heard of these subjects, but other than grammar, most of us really are unfamiliar with what these terms mean in their deep sense. Well, in 2001, 2002, I inherited the She Who Remembers audio archives. And in there were 70 hours worth of Terrence McKenna audio, which was the first stuff that we put out on the internet. And I was studying all of that stuff back then as we were putting it out. But uh, I started noticing a lot of problems in McKenna's work uh, when I was writing my first book back in 2004-2005, Astrotheology and Shamanism. Just a lot of inconsistencies in the work. Uh, Dr. Brian Akers has shown that his, uh, his whole uh, stoned ape theory was completely fraudulent, that he, he made up uh, fraudulent citations to Roland A. Fisher, etc., regarding that stuff. But when we get into his background, we see that his largest influences are guys like Marshall McLuhan, who wrote his PhD thesis on the classical trivium, which is using the trivium for mind control rather than freeing right. people. And then we get into, uh, you know, and I've mapped out his whole background, but uh, or not his whole background, but I've mapped out much of his background. And, um, you know, he's uh, tied into the Esalen Institute, which we've pinpointed as the center of MK Ultra. He's also involved in selling cybernetics, which Kybernetes is government control or from the ancient Greek. Uh, one of his largest influences is also Aldous Huxley, who we've got uh, just about nailed down now from his own works that uh, he was one of the directors or one of the top guys of uh, MK Ultra. He was also influenced by Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, who is a uh, Jesuit priest who came up with the Omega Point theory. And then the 2012 theory that he later promoted was actually developed by uh, CIA agent Professor... Emeritus Michael Coe from Yale. And um, so, you know, he, once we get that, you know, that, oh, and he's also selling uh, transhumanism. He was at the Tussman Experimental College, some other stuff going out there, going on there. But uh, when we understand that it was Julian Huxley working with the British Eugenics Society, uh, one of uh, De Chardin's books uh, was. Uh, provided a forward or introduction by Julian Huxley. Yeah, that's right. Get a big name to do the forward, and that promotes the book. I mean, we still do it today, don't we? Uh, that's exactly right. And in fact, oh, yeah. uh, uh, Julian Huxley wrote the introduction to the 1950s or 60s version of Darwin's book. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, keep publishing Darwin's book. Even so, was, so uh, Teilhard de Chardin, he wrote, uh, obviously, he created the Omega Point, which is what the modern idea of the uh, 2012 end of the world scenario that's supposed to happen on the 21st this week, that's where that comes from, is from Teilhard himself. Yeah, and then to. Teilhard uh, appears to have been involved in the Piltdown hoax. Yeah. And uh, he wrote a book called The Phenomenon of Man. And that's right. Yeah, that was what I was trying to think of. No okay, so, uh, so... How does how how does he tie it all together? And he brings together all of these uh, uh, people from different churches and religious backgrounds to help sell this theory. Is that correct? Yeah. Is Julian Huxley working with the British Eugenic Society, 
who created these ideas of transhumanism and humanism. And also Terrence McKenna was selling feminism, which we've uh, done much to expose with, uh, you know, Karen of Girl Rights What. She's uh, done extensive work to expose how the whole feminist movement was, again, to destroy this sacred masculine, to get people off balance, to focus on the wrong issue and instead of rather you know, instead of being effective. And essentially the focus there is to destroy the family unit, because if you can destroy the family unit, there's nothing for people to fall back on as, uh, you know, society collapses, etc. Well, let me uh, let me echo that recommendation. I've only recently encountered uh, uh, Girl Writes What, but absolutely, if really interesting research going on there. Um, uh, again, there's so many different threads to this that it might be confusing for people who haven't read the article. So, of course, I'm going to put the link into the show sure. notes, and I, I really do recommend that people go and read through the article and and go into your previous research as well, including your your, your research last year on on Watson. But why don't we uh, go back to a point that I, I brought up at the very beginning of the conversation, and I don't want to let it go before we go, um, talking about the the, uh, the creation of LSD and the popular narrative of how that went versus uh, indications that that might not be the, the real story. Sure. Well, you know, next month, in fact, a, a friend of mine out of England, Alan Piper, is going to be publishing a new uh, paper in the journal Time and Mind, that actually reveals that in 1933, a uh, Jewish novelist by the name of Leo Perutz published a novel called St. Peter's Snow, where in this book, they are working with ergot derivatives of wheat to, dis to create a new, never-before-discovered uh, psychedelic. And, and actually, they do talk about how they go back through and they're studying the ancient mysteries and things and trying to figure out what it is. And then they say, well, we think it's wheat and, and this uh, rye. But in the story, they're very clear that it's not a chemical that's found naturally in nature, such as LSA, which is found in morning glories and ergot naturally can produce LSA, which is maybe a hundred times less uh, psychoactive as LSD. And so, you know, there's only two or three, there's hydroxy LSA, LSA and LSD. Those are the only possibilities for a hallucinogenic uh, substance to for this book to be talking about. So, you know, by process of logical deduction, none that are found in nature, we automatically remove LSA and hydroxy LSA and we're left with LSD. So in this book, they're using LSD 10 years before Hoffman supposedly invents it to create a new religion to bring about and this is a Jewish author writing about trying to bring about a Roman emperor to his throne. So, of course, more tongue-in-cheek stuff here. And then uh, we have the, uh, the storyline finishing with the, the chemist who actually invents the drug starting a communist revolution instead. And so, I mean, and when you, when you see all of the tie-ins between you know, communism and uh, how they've twisted the psychedelic revolution without critical thinking, it all makes a really tidy package. And and here this guy, he's either, you know, magic and predicting the future, or he's a scion or something like that, and he's got an in, and he knows uh, who's doing the, the research uh, for real. And as, you know, as is, is clear, because... Uh, you know, it, it just it really proves that Albert Hoffman could not have invented LSD and that the whole Bicycle Day story is just part of the religion. And of course, you know, that makes Albert Hoffman and Terrence McKenna, Gordon Wass and Timothy Leary, these guys just hierophants of this new dark age religion that they're selling. Yeah, I, I think he definitely fell for a lot of, um, you know, uh, poisonous ideas at some point, like the transhumanism part and uh, a lot of new age stuff. Um, that's why I think it's so important for people to have active filters when they take information sure. in and not accept everything that anyone says. I, I've sure. often said I don't agree with, uh, even amongst people who I consider mentors uh, for my own awakening, I don't take every single thing that they say and just accept it. Uh, you have to look at each claim that they make and then run it through a filtration system and see sure. if it comes out the other end as, as holding true. So I think uh, that's really one of the Im important parts of, of uh, information, of truth discovery. Uh, and that's what really the trivium is, is a process of truth discovery. Uh, again, uh, you know, certain things, if you take them wholesale, can lead to a state of imbalance, as you said. 
And uh, part of that whole new age um, agenda is to create an imbalance toward the the feminine side of the individual, whereas the masculine side kind of dies away and the person won't stand up for their rights. It's very important to maintain that balance at all times and never to go into a one form of imbalance or another, either becoming like a dominator who's bent on control or becoming someone who will just, uh, you know, uh, accept everything and just uh, let their rights be tread upon. How useful that this is because now the citizen can see the events and see the, the trajectory of them, the goals, and then, like, if you get to the point where you understand 1968 Hollywood strip, right. where you just go, hey, I get it, these, these musicians, this music, Vito and the freaks, these are all people working for the government. These are all people that are, that are here to try to help us take drugs, to try to get us to, to, to behave in a certain way. Well, now when you go forward and you suddenly see Esalen, Right. You see, you see the same individual setting up the New Age religion, the New Age thinking. Well, how hard is it to, to understand that? Right. How hard is it to understand that? So, so this is why it's valuable to, to really try to take all of the citizens from, you know, the really the be where you can see the plan clearly, where you can see the first beginnings of it, you can see how it's connected. And, um, you know, one place that people should be going to just religiously is... Uh, Gnostic media website to look at the brain because the brain the the, the software that Jan has developed yeah. will just help well, them. I didn't develop it. Well, I mean, but you've used it, and, and, but it'll help people walk right through it. Yes, you know, right. you can yes. walk right through to where you get to the 1968 Sunset Strip is understood, and then when you get to S1, which start the 72 something like that. Like 68. Okay, 60, well there is well then, yeah. then then but suddenly it's not there's no you don't have to work too hard. No, anymore. no, it's all there. Yeah, it's all there if you yeah. want. So, it's a reference. Uh, Al Hubbard was the sole licensed importer of LSD in North America, specifically in Canada. He was an American citizen. He was forced to relocate to Canada because he was facing congressional indictment for activities that he performed during the end of World War II, uh, chiefly which was to load boats uh, and ship equipment uh, from the West Coast, Los Angeles, San Diego, Seattle, loaded with uh, uranium materials to England. And this violated certain federal protocols and uh, people in Congress found out and he was under federal indictment. And with the help of uh, then OSS apparatus, senior apparatus, he was helped to be given a Canadian citizenship and relocated to Canada and became a Canadian citizen. How he did was, you, how did you begin investigating him? Um, like a whole lot of other people, I had read two books, and there are two books that you've read and that thousands of other people have read. The first being Acid Dreams by Martin Lee and Bruce Schlein. And the other was Storming Heaven, LSD and the American Dream by Jay Stevens. And I was living in Santa Barbara. I was back in Santa Barbara at that time after graduating from Arizona State University. This was 1989. I was back in Santa Barbara. I had been accepted into the master's degree in professional writing at University of Southern California. I had a full-time job in Santa Barbara. And so I commuted two nights a week to uh, USC to attend classes in my first semester. I was taking a lot of LSD at the time, a lot. And a friend of mine turned me on to both of these books, Acid Dreams and Storming Heaven. I had never heard of them. They had just recently been published. I believe both were published in 1987. So this was only a year and a half or two years maximum after they were first published. But I had not heard of these books before. Uh, as an aficionado of LSD, I read both of these books, was just 
blown away at the subject matter and the intensity of the research that both Martin Lee and Jay Stevens had conducted in their respective books. But one character, one human being, one person out of all of the litany of people who are featured in both of these books jumped out at me. And that was a man named Al Hubbard. And he just jumped right out at me. And it was almost as if uh, something supernatural was telling me, you need to know more about this man. Not enough has been done. There are fragments, there are stories, there are brief, brief chapters in both books on Al Hubbard, but there was a lot more to know, and I was the guy to do it. And that was my obsession for the next two years. So Al Hubbard was known as the... Acid Messiah and the Johnny Appleseed of LSD. Why is that? He was known as three things. The Johnny Appleseed of LSD, the original Captain Trips, and the Acid Messiah. Those are three titles that were conveyed upon him. Why was that? He imported all, and I am talking about all of the LSD from Sandoz Laboratories in Switzerland to distribute to psychiatrists in the United States of America. So when you read about Carrot and Jack Nicholson and Stanley Kubrick and novelist Anise well, we'll, we'll get to them in a bit though. Sure, sure, sure. All of that acid that psychiatrists dispensed to these very, very famous people came from Al Hubbard. Al Hubbard was the dealer. He was the distributor of the entirety. And I'm talking about 100% of the LSD that came into the Hollywood community in the very early days before the hippies, before acid was ever even talked about. Sure. Came from Al Hubbard. You know, why don't we start off uh, or give people a little bit of background on how I got into this area of research. And then from there, we'll take it back to ancient Greece and then come forward. So back in uh, originally in 2005, I published a book called Astrotheology and Shamanism, where we were uh, looking at uh, the history of, uh, of drugs and astrotheology as a basis of, of Judeo-Christianity. In there, we published some primary ancient Christian documents from the 4th century Church Father Epiphanius talking about how the uh, the the sons uh, or the the birth of Jesus was based on the solar calculations around the the uh, Christmas celebrations, and so this was a, a primary document that essentially proved that. But while researching that, we came across a lot of the attacks that have been published out there for many years against the Dead Sea Scrolls scholar and famous or infamous author of the sacred mushroom and the cross. And the reason why, uh, as of, you know, since 2009, I've been into his work is because with his daughter in 2009, we republished his book, the sacred mushroom and the cross. But in 2000, you know, from 2006 until 2008, I was investigating his background and all of these attacks that were published everywhere against him in the media by Gordon Wasson and the psychedelic community in the academic community. And we were going through uh, essentially myself and Allegra's daughter and looking up each of the attacks and pulling up the original citations, seeing what he wrote and what the claims were against him. And what we found out writing that book was that a man named R. Gordon Wasson, who is the so-called discoverer of, of magic mushrooms, he launched all of the attacks against Allegro. So on doing uh, more research on his background, I later discover that he's the vice president of propaganda for J.P. Morgan Bank, etc. But anyway, in, in writing my book, The Holy Mushroom, that really, you know, what we did was not only did we publish the first primary medieval Christian text specifically discussing the use of the holy mushroom in the uh, Greek Orthodox Church, 
Uh, but we also published 41, uh, you know, there's in the color edition, I published 41 uh, color iconographic images showing the mushrooms. And we did a line by line uh, showing Allegro's claims, the attacks against him, and then debunking it. And we literally refuted every single ta attack against this area of his research regarding the sacred mushroom in the cross and any associations of mushrooms being used in Judeo-Christianity. Now, you know, a lot of people will say, well, I've taken mushrooms, they're a spiritual thing, and there's no way that anybody could be using these for a negative thing. Well, you know, when we begin to think of, uh, the, you know, the, the, Jude the, Jew the Jewish and Christian churches being patriarchal churches, and then we begin to think of how now we have evidence that they were, in fact, using these things. In the book of Zohar, there's a reference to the, the red mushroom or red fungus being used there. And uh, so we have references to these things. Now, these are patriarchal religions. So this should give us pause, which is what happened to me when I was writing these books, is going, now, wait a second. Are they for spiritual or is there something else going on? So I want to make clear to the listeners, because I get a, a lot of attacks for this, and a lot of people will say, no, it was all blowback. All the CIA agents, they're just dumb dupes. They couldn't have done this stuff. And so, you know, when we, when we step back and we look at this other side of these things, that maybe they weren't just dupes and maybe this was intentional, then it shows us that the church used them for control. And going all the way back to bring up a point that you brought up at the beginning, we look at the Lucinian mysteries. Now, interestingly, the word mystery means to mystify, to stupefy, to d dumb down or control, essentially. So in the word, or in the, in the name, Lucinian mysteries, they're telling us what it is. And so I begin looking at this, and uh, back in 1976, Gordon Wasson, Carl, Carl A.P. Ruck of Boston University, and Albert Hoffman, who supposedly invented LSD, wrote this book, The Road to Ulysses, stating that, you know, this was a society, an example of a society that was all based on psychedelic spirituality. Well, I begin to look at it, and it turns out that there's two families that control the entire celebration at Ulysses. The, I forget their names in, in ancient Greek. And uh, they basically kept control, and the government had control of this this uh, drug initiation for 2,000 years. And so, you know, they'll claim that, you know, it was, by sponta uh, it was a spontaneous thing, thing that it managed to uh, be kept secret throughout all of this time. Meanwhile, saying that guys like Socrates were killed for exposing it. Oh. Listening? I am listening. Are you paying attention? You mean me or them out there? Them out there. Gotcha. You know? You know? Question is, can we wake up? You know, we're asleep. How many, what's the percentage that is even aware of what's going on? It's trivial. Let me tell you something. Time to wake up. It's time to take off the, the, the coverings and take off the, throw away the, uh, the, uh, the distortions and see, understand. Again, get the blinders off your eyes. Get the earmuffs off your ears so that you're understanding exactly what's going on and where you're headed. Because if you don't do that, you're gonna be taken in and suddenly you're gonna be a slave. Now, do you wanna be a slave or do you wanna be a free person? Your choice, you know, and the time is now. Right now, you better get the earmuffs off and the eye blinders off and see and hear what's really happening so that you then can make the choice of which do you want to be free or a slave choose
Quote, Whoever, under color of any law, statute, ordinance, regulation, or custom, willfully subjects any person in any state, territory, commonwealth, possession, or district to the deprivation of any rights, privileges, or immunities secured or protected by the Constitution or laws of the United States, shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than one year or both. And if bodily injury results from the acts committed in violation of this section, or if such acts include the use, attempted use, or threatened use of a dangerous weapon, explosives, or fire, shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than ten years, or both. And if death results from the acts committed in violation of this section, or if such acts include kidnapping or an attempt to kidnap, aggravated sexual abuse, or an attempt to commit aggravated sexual abuse, or an attempt to kill, shall be fined under this title or imprisoned for any term of years, or for life, or both, or may be sentenced to death. <laughs>